Welcome back. We're now ready to start a bit of a new chapter in the course, which is we're going to be talking about classes and objects, and in particular, object-oriented programming, which may be something you've heard about. And we're going to spend the next full three lectures uh, talking about exactly what that is. So let's just go ahead and uh, dive in. All right, let me just define a few simple terms. A class is something that combines and abstracts out data and functionality. And it's important to understand those two things, uh, data and functionality. Up until now, we have been talking about really mostly functionality. A little bit on data when we talked about lists, a little bit of data when we talked about different types of variable types. But for the most part, we've been focused on functionality. Iterative constructs, conditional constructs, function, parameters in, parameters out, recursion. And now we're going to talk about sort of putting all these pieces together and how we combine, of course, data and function. And so what a class does is it combines the storing of information, data, and functionality on that data. An object is just an instantiation of a class. And I want to distinguish between these two because it's a really important I'm going to be using the words, but it's also an important conceptual distinction. And so maybe the, the simplest way to think about this distinction is this way. You can think about a class as a blueprint to a house. You can't live in it, but it sort of tells you how to build it. And the object is, well, the house itself. So I can take this blueprint and cookie cutter that down the street and get multiple instantiations of this object. So think about the class is a definition of something and an object as an instantiation of it. It's an actual thing that we now get to manipulate. And I'll be using these terms um, in, uh, uh, throughout the next few weeks. I just want to make sure that we understand the distinction between a class, which is a definition, and an object, which is a thing that we've actually created that we can now act on. Now, as I said, a class combines and abstracts data and functions. An object is an instantiation of that class. And I've been hinting this throughout the whole semester is we've sort of seen objects and classes already. There's that dot notation that's been lingering around. Um, I think I probably mentioned that a string at some point is sort of like a class. A list is like a class. So here's a really simple example of a class. A string is a built-in class. That's the data is the string itself, quote unquote, aardvark. The functionality is append. I can append something to the end of a string. Yeah. An integer is a built-in class, stores data, the actual number, and the addition operator is a function on that data. So now you see what I mean when I say data and functionality. We store information, a string, an integer, a list, and then we can operate on that. We provide you, the programmer, functionality to operate on that data. Okay. Now, I don't think it'll surprise you to learn that we can define our own classes. It's not just whatever Python gives us and that's all we can do. We can define our own classes, our own data, our own functionality, and then build up really nice functionality from that. And that's what we're going to spend, of course, the majority of our time doing is talking about how we define our own classes. All right. So let me start off by saying I'm going to define a class for you. And it's going to unfold over a series of, of lectures. Um, and the class is of type ball. Right there you see that. So this, and, I, and I'm going to sort of do a bit of a sleight of hand here. I'm not going to show you the details of the, of the class or the object just yet. I'm going to tell you that we have this object, this class called a ball class. And what it allows you to do is store some data, which is the position and the speed of the ball. And the functionality is you can move the ball, you can render the ball, et cetera, et cetera. And again, I'm not going to show you the code for a little bit, because I want to, again, start sort of conceptually, and then we'll dive into the details of how all this works. So the, the class that we define, called ball, has a constructor. And this line of code is calling the constructor to do what? To instantiate an object. So there it is. I have a ball class, and I want to build a ball. The way I do that is I call this constructor. Um, the, the constructor is just the name of the class, and then some information about what I want my object to be. In this case, it's the xy position of the ball and the xy velocity of the ball. And we'll talk some more about what, what we're going to do with all those things. And then, of course, my ball is now an object of type class ball. Yeah. 
So this looks pretty similar to everything we've seen before. It's a function call. In this case, it happens to be a constructor, which I'm going to describe in more detail in a second, to a, a class of type ball. It's going to return something back, and that now is going to be an object. Now, this constructor is really, really special and very important, and we're going to spend a little time talking about it before I actually show you the code for how to build this um, class. So what the constructor does, number one, is that Remember, this class is just this concept. It's just a blueprint. I don't physically have anything yet. I don't have an actual object. So the first thing it's going to do is it's going to create, in memory, a ball object. So it reaches into memory, it allocates some memory, and it says, OK, we're going to store some information in here, some data with al along with some functionality. And it does that for you. Good, not number one. So actually create the ball. Number two, it's going to initialize the data based on what you per passed it. So now what it says is, OK, I can have multiple balls, the same way I can have multiple houses. I'm going to build an object. I'm going to allocate memory for it. And I'm going to store the data that the user wants, x, y position, vx, vy, velocity in the x and the y direction. Good, initialization. And it returns to you, this is really important, the address of the ball object that was uh, allocated in memory and initialized for you. Okay? Now this sounds should sound pretty familiar to you because this sounds a lot like a list. With a list, what do we do? We say square bracket, square bracket, slightly different syntax for calling it constructor, a bunch of data in the list, comma delimited elements. What does Python do? It reaches into memory, allocates some space, sticks the data in there, allocation and initialization, and what does it hand you back? The address of a list. Not the actual list, but the address to the list, which you can, of course, then reference the contents of the list. So in fact, and I think I even hinted at this, lists are a built-in object, and they do all three of these things. Good. So this is sort of the picture you can have in your head. And we, we've seen a picture like this when we did lists. So I'm, I have a class called ball. Again, you have no idea how I've done this. And we're going we're gonna to get there. So just abstract out the details of this for a minute. And you know, because I tell you, that you can generate, you can build a ball. It has four pieces of information you need to specify. Where is it on a drawing um, uh, canvas? Uh, how fast is it moving in the horizontal and vertical direction? Um, and so when you call this constructor, it does what? It allocates some memory. That's this box. It initializes the variables, which are, I'm going to tell you are called x, y, v, x, v, y, which we'll see in a few minutes, to the values you passed in, 10, 15, 0, negative 5. And it hands you back an address to the object. So this, again, is just some random number. It's just, some, it's just a, a pointer to where it is. So I have an object in memory. I've instantiated an, uh, uh, something of type ball, a class of type. And now I have two things at my disposal. I have the data which I've just initialized, and I have all the functionality that comes with this class, which I haven't shown you yet, but I will in a minute. Now, if I define another ball, here's ball 2, with a different x, y position, 12 and 23, and a different velocity, 2 and 3, um, then what happens is, well, that's a call to the constructor. The constructor allocates memory. It initializes four variables, and it hands you back an address, and now I have two objects completely separate from each other. Right? Uh, this is a call to a constructor, please build a ball object. This is a call to a constructor, create another one. And I can do this all day long. And each one of these stores its own data. Each one has access to functionality to do what we want to this ball object. Good. So, uh, and again, I haven't shown you how the constructor works. I haven't shown you how to define a class. I haven't shown you anything yet. But I want to sort of abstract that out for a minute and get through these concepts. And then we're going to dive into the details of that in the next segment. OK, just let me make a few points before we, we finish up here. So when I define an object ball1, I can access the various elements of the data that I initialize. Remember, it's x, y, v, x, v, y, using that little dot notation right there. So ball1, of course, is the name of the object. And I can reach in to that object and I can access the data and the functionality, of course, using that dot notation. So you remember a while back we introduced that dot notation, and I sort of waved my hands vigorously to tell you this is some syntactic thing having to do with object-oriented programming. Don't worry about it. We'll get to it. We're getting to it. 
This dot notation is part of accessing either data or functionality associated with an object. So you give the object name, dot, and then the data type. And of course, you can see why this is. If I can create multiple objects, it's not x per se, it's this ball's x or this ball's uh, y or vx or vy. So I have to say which object do you want and then which data element of that. Same thing with a house. If I have five houses that are the same, I can't say go uh, deliver this package to ball or house. I have to say this house, this address, and then you go into that particular house and get what you want out of it. Good. And um, I can also access functions associated with objects. And again, I haven't shown you how to do this yet, but I just want to introduce the notation. So here what I'm doing is I'm initializing a ball at position 5, 4 with velocity 3 and 6. And I can print the x coordinate by just saying ball1, that's of course the name of the variable, dot x. And when I print this out, it will print for me 5 because that is the x position here. Now remember that classes bundle up data and functionality, things that you can actually do. What functionality? Well, whatever I want. So for a list, I can add things, remove things, append things, sort things. That's the, the functionality that's been given to me. For this ball class, well, we're going to see in a little bit, but it's whatever I want to do for the ball class. That's my job as the constructor of this class to give you certain amounts of functionality. I will tell you that one of the functionality is a function called update position. It takes as input a time step and it moves the ball's position according to the velocity. Okay, so let's just think about this for a second. This is in some pixel coordinates and velocity is what? How many pixels are you moving per second or per frame? So with a time step of 0 0.1, um, when I update the position of this ball, its x coordinate moves from position 5 to position 5 plus 1 tenth of 3. Because this is 3 pixels per second, I've moved for half a, uh, 1 tenth of a second, and so I've moved 0.3 pixels, and now it has a new position. Okay? So notice here that the function associated with the object ball is operating on the data associated with the object uh, ball. Okay? So again, this class bundles up data, information about what you are storing, and then gives you the ability to manipulate that data, data through functions. Okay? And there again is that dot notation. I'm not calling the function update position. That's not a function. That's a function associated with a class of type ball. I'm calling this ball's update position. And another ball, it has a different update position. Why? Because it has to operate on its own data. So every time you instantiate an object, you get the data and the functionality associated with that object. Okay, I know that was a lot. There's a lot of sort of conceptual things going on here, a lot of syntactical thing. Hold on, we're going to do a couple more segments of this lecture, and I'm going to start now to um, reveal how you build these classes and objects and show you where the data is, where the functionality is, um, and hopefully this will become more clear. All right, let's pick it up in a few minutes.